Good day, citizens. Good day, Thomas Jefferson, our podcast listeners, and thank you for listening. Oh, my. Here we go, David. This huge, crazy national controversy over the Supreme Court is now beginning, and I tell you, you're going to hear about almost nothing else for the next six months. It's important. Well, it is important, but you know, I I tried to talk to Mr. Jefferson about my optimism, and I talked to you, and I asked him if he thought I was naive, and he did not say yes. I did not yes. answer. <laughs> yeah, but I really do believe that we don't know what we're going to get. Well, you know, remember what... <laughs> What uh, David Eisen, Dwight David Eisenhower has said yeah, to have but, said, he said, I, I made two mistakes during my presidency and they're both on the Supreme Court. Yeah. I love that. It's not, it's probably apocryphal, but it's a great, great line. Back to my naivete. Well, think of how the country responded to John Roberts when he, when he affirmed the Affordable Care Act. You know, they expected that he would be on the right side, the anti-Affordable Care Act side. He voted to affirm it and made a lot of enemies. One of the things Jefferson hates is that there's lifetime appointments, and I'm going, okay, but yeah, maybe that's good because they're not going to have to answer to anybody. I don't think he so. didn't quite, you don't either. I don't either. I think that we should have the Missouri plan. If, if you know what the Missouri plan is, that someone gets named to a court, you become a justice of the court in Missouri. Many states have adopted this. Then after a period of four or six or seven years, you have to stand for a vote of confidence. If you pass that vote of confidence, you're in, either for life or for another long period. But the idea is that a person is appointed, a she or a he, they have a trial period of X number of years, and then we have a last chance to retire them if we think we need to, if they are corrupt or if they're, if they're senile or if they are bigoted or if their personal behavior becomes a public issue. The idea under the Missouri plan, which is widely admired as the best possible way to go about this, is to give people effective life tenure, but they have to pass muster at least once and maybe more than once in a vote of confidence or no confidence. I think that's the answer. I do agree with your main point that people, once they get tenure, often surprise us that you don't know what uh, Neil Gorsuch is going to think 15 years from now. You don't know what... Clarence Thomas is going to think five years from now. People change. Well, like they don't have to answer to anybody, but maybe that's the naive part. But Jefferson, here, let me say Jefferson's view of this. It's really, it's it's kind of a nuance. He said, we want our judicial branch to be independent of the people. Otherwise, how could they sort these things out? But we don't want them to be absolutely independent of the people. Then they become a tyranny. So you want them to have enough independence, to be safe, to make unpopular decisions and get away with it when they have to say, you're violating the First Amendment, you're violating the Fifth Amendment, you're violating the Eighth Amendment. But we want them to be not so independent that they become an, a little nine-member tyranny. So Jefferson understood this balance. I don't think we have it now. If you think of what just happened in Ireland, Ireland just voted by a very strong majority to liberalize its abortion laws. That was a vote of the people of Ireland. That's where this belongs. A, a decision of this sort about affirmative action, about the Second Amendment, about immigration, uh, these belong with the people in some massive sense. That's really Jefferson's point, is that uh, in your essay, you talk about a baseball game with no umpires. Right. Well, but I mean, think of it this way, just to take... I mean, I don't want to get into the question of abortion, neither do you. But the polls show that something like 63 to 67 percent of the American people want to keep things more or less as they are. That's two-thirds majority. So let's say that the court meeting two years from now strikes down Roe v. Wade and outlaws most or all abortions in this country. Now nine people, what's the percentage that they represent of 330 million? have overturned the will, 67% of the American people having lived with this for 40 years say, we kind of like it the way it is. We're not happy with it, but it beats any alternative that you might want to put forward. Let's just leave it alone. We want what Bill Clinton said. We want abortions to be legal, safe, and rare. Legal, safe, and rare. That appears to be the will of about two-thirds of the American people. I get that, but you also have to take into account that, as you said, elections matter. 
the current president was uh, put in office. and Yes. And he said he was going to do this. He so, said he was going to do this. And so elections matter. I'm with you on that. When it comes to Jefferson, I don't want to say he ducked it, but he went to his old standby, tear up the Constitution. He's right. You know, the, the if you had said to any of the founding fathers, will there ever be a set of case law of a fundamental nature about abortion, they would have said that is a that is such a private world that it has no place in the public square. They would never have been able to contemplate that we're having this discussion. So how is it, therefore, that we are now having this discussion? The Founding Fathers couldn't anticipate this stuff, David. They didn't know that a 9 millimeter handgun could shoot 100 people in three minutes. They didn't know that our borders were going to become uh, so porous with the north-south issues that the world is, the whole globe is facing. They didn't know about radical Islam. They didn't know about any. They didn't know about cyber pornography or cyber predation or cyber terrorism. They couldn't have anticipated our world. So why do we think? I think Jefferson's right. You say his, it's his old standby, but his view is: How about write a constitution that faces the issues of your time? There are many things the founding fathers could not have imagined, including how's this for a segue? Podcasts, <laughs> and we are dependent upon those of you listeners who listen. You know, oh, I keep getting these emails comes. from people that say, "You know, it's all right that you remind us." And so we want to just, if you enjoy the Thomas Jefferson Hour, please consider supporting it. Uh, visit jeffersonhour.com. Even if you're not going there to give us money, there's great uh, information on shows. There's old shows, um, and that is the portal to. Uh, to all of that. Plus, if you go there and click on donate, you can support the Thomas Jefferson Hour without your support and your listenership. We are nothing. So please consider that. Can I speak to this for a moment? Absolutely. You have to do the voice, though. I can't. I don't have your sonorous <laughs> oh, voice. Please. I've been, I've been wrestling, agonizing over the past few months about where we are. I've read everything I can get my hands on. I just read a book called How Democracies Die, which I highly recommend to our podcast listeners. How Democracies Die, uh, jointly authored. We are at what may turn out to be an existential moment in the history of the United States. I don't want to get into that at the moment, but I, what I do want to say is that the Thomas Jefferson Hour is an attempt to provide historical grounding logical clarity, a sense of context and nuance, a generosity of spirit that doesn't try to demonize the other side automatically, but a skepticism about the arguments of anybody about these questions. This, In my opinion, I wish I were so much better at this than I am. I wish I were a perfect embodiment of enlightenment clarity and the Socratic method. But I'll tell you this, the praise that we get it's from people who say, thank goodness there is such a thing as an attempt at generosity of spirit, an attempt at synthesis, an attempt at clarity, a grounding in history, a use of evidence in the way that evidence is supposed to be used, a kind of a, 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 an emancipation from talking points and memes and tropes. That's what I try to do. And if I'm not doing a good enough job, I want to be told that by our listeners. But but I believe that we need this kind of thing, not this, but this kind of thing, like the Jefferson Hour, now more than ever. We are at one of the pivotal moments, I think. I think it's the most pivotal moment of my lifetime, and, and there is some reason to believe that we could be descending into chaos here. The partisanship, the, the metaphor that these two authors in How Democracies Die use is guardrails. You have your constitution, but then you have these guardrails that are not in the Constitution, but they've been used, courtesy, deference, respect, not demonizing the opposition, not calling the press enemies of the people, not doing arbitrary things. They say these guardrails are the reason that our democracy has worked. And both parties in the last 30 or so years, but particularly the conservatives, but both parties have been demolishing the guardrails. And their view is, beware of what you're doing here, folks, because if you, if you break down the soft constitutional guardrails of a free society, you may be descending into not just a cold civil war, as Carl Bernstein calls it, but an actual set of armed exchanges and violence. I think everyone needs to read this book, How Democracies Die, whatever your politics. And we need 
more of what the Jefferson Hour represents, that we would be better off, that, that we, could, we could rise out of this swamp, this slough, this miasma, and begin to say, in the spirit of the Enlightenment, sir, I disagree with what you say, but I shall defend to the death your right to say it. That's the principle we need to get back to. And on that note, if you do have a question or a comment for President Jefferson, for Clay, for the show, write us. Go to jeffersonhour.com. And in fact, if, if you'd like to, please include your phone number and a good time to call, and perhaps we can record your question and include it in the show that way. We'd really like to do that. Thanks much for listening. Thank you, citizens. And listen now to this Supreme Court issue of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. Good day, citizens, and welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with President Thomas Jefferson. Mr. Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author Clay Jenkinson. I'm your host, David Swenson, and seated across from me is President Thomas Jefferson. Good to see you, sir. Good day to you, my dear citizen. I'd like to begin our conversation with a pleasantry, Mr. Jefferson, but... I have a serious subject to discuss with you this week. What might that be, sir? Something I know you have strong opinions about, and that is the Supreme Court, sir. Well, I was a victim of the Supreme Court uh, in the last hours of his discredited one-term administration. John Adams packed our federal judicial system with men who were sworn enemies to me and to my vision of this country. These are known historically as the midnight appointments. Some of them were so rushed that the actual physical documents were not put into the hands of the intended recipient. Some of them were still left on the desk of the Secretary of State at the time that Adams uh, departed from Washington, D.C. I felt that as a one-term president, having been uh, retired to private life by the American people, that Adams should do nothing after the election results were clear, to hamstring the work of his successor. It seemed to me wrong that he would pack the courts with high federalists and men who despised me just to prevent me from enacting the legislative program which I had expressed to the American people. Elections matter. Adams had one view of this country. I had a different view of this country. It was an honest contest. Americans understood the difference. He wanted more government. I less. I believe in states' rights. He believes in greater federal authority. I trust humans to govern themselves. He's more skeptical, etc. He tilts towards England. I tilt towards France. We could go on and on. The country knew the difference. And in the election of 1800, they chose me and retired him. They spoke. Their will had been spoken. It would be one thing for him to fill the courts with people who were neutral But instead, he filled them with people who were my sworn enemies trying to forestall what I called the Second American Revolution. And so I was deeply uh, disappointed in his behavior. And John Marshall, the man he named as the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court in the last year of his presidency, went on to serve for 34 years, sir, and became one of the, uh, the most important high Federalists in the history of the Supreme Court. He he effectively transformed the interpretation of our Constitution and made it much more national, powerful, centralized, and capitalist than it would have been in the hands of somebody of a more neutral um, political persuasion. So I was appalled by this. And when I later had an exchange with Abigail Adams about the death of my daughter Maria, We drifted into some political topics, and I said one thing and one thing only uh, in your husband's behavior offended me, and that was the midnight appointments when it was very clear that the American people wanted to move in in a different direction. Mr. Jefferson, I was going to start our conversation by, by asking you what your general attitude towards this third branch of government was, but I believe you've made that quite clear in your opening statement, sir. Well, I believe in legislative supremacy. So in a state of nature, each one of us governs himself. When we create a social compact, we provide mechanisms to distill the will of the people. If the will of the people is to wear blue uniforms and not orange, and we elect somebody to be our president or representative, 
we expect him to try to bring about the result that we agree upon. We believe in majority rule. If possible, we want consensus. And if we want blue uniforms and the president thinks we should have orange ones or red ones instead, he's not representing us. That's the theory of democracy, that instead of governing ourselves in pure democracy, we create representative Republican democracy, and the people that we choose are elected, and they fulfill what they take to be the will of the people. That means that the the branch of the federal government that's most important is the legislative branch because it's the one that, that listens to the people and tries to gather their views and then distill them into enlightened law. The courts are a distant third cousin. They don't create law. They're not elected by the people. They don't stand for re-election from time to time. They serve for life. And that means that they're too detached from the dynamics of our society to represent that society faithfully. We should never put power into the hands of people that are independent of the will of the nation. And so I'm against life tenure. I'm against politicizing and aggrandizing the judicial branch. It should be the very quiet, humble, meek, and diffident third cousin of the other two branches, and the one that matters most in a free society is the legislative branch, where debate can occur, where the people can contact their legislators, where they can punish a rogue legislator by retiring him at the next election. If, if somebody doesn't represent me well, then at the next election I vote for somebody else. I vote to retire him. That's the principle of majority rule. But if I name somebody to the Supreme Court and he serves for 50 years, if he does things that are not only not representative of my will, but are antagonistic to the very ideas of American constitutional democracy, we have no recourse. He can't be diselected. He serves for life on good behavior. And I can ask all of your listeners to turn to their history books. There has never once been a successful impeachment and conviction of a Supreme Court justice of the United States. They have life tenure and they serve far longer than would be healthy in any free society. Mr. Jefferson, I, I understand that you naturally you were irritated by the Supreme Court, the midnight appointments. I must say, sir, it's rare that I see you quite this agitated. Because I believe in democracy. Now, it's a republic rather than an Athenian-style democracy, but I believe in the will of the people. And the people have a right to govern themselves according to their best lights. They will sometimes go wrong. They will sometimes be illiberal. They will sometimes be swept away by whim or fanaticism or a, a national or international emergency, of course. But the response to that should not be to take government away from them. The response should be to train them through public education so they make better choices and weigh evidence more carefully and seek for enlightenment. We can't have a group of referees who stand outside of the process and tell us who we are and what we really want and explain to us why what we did in our legislative bodies doesn't suit them and therefore they veto it by judicial review. You know, if you look at your constitution, sir, and read it with all the care that you possibly can, you cannot point to any clause in that constitution which sets up the principle of judicial review. In other words, there is nothing that the founders of the Constitution put into the Constitution itself or mentioned in the Federalist Papers that would enable the judicial branch of government to sit in isolation and strike down legislation duly passed by the House of Representatives, by the Senate of the United States, and signed by the sitting president. There is no such mention, no such clause, no such principle in the Constitution. That notion of judicial veto or judicial review was imposed upon the Constitution in Marbury v. Madison in 1803 by my cousin, John Marshall, and that was an effective constitutional junta that changed the very nature of our constitutional society without a plebiscite, without a referendum, without an amendment. As I said, Mr. Jefferson, it's rare to see you so agitated about a, a specific issue. If we could... You have this unique viewpoint, sir, of being there when the government was formed 
and uh, following through to my time. And I'm wondering, if you could take yourself out of the equation and look at this, what would you define the proper function of the Supreme Court to be? Well, it is the court of highest appeal. So there has to be a final arbiter if Kentucky and Virginia get into a dispute. They don't go to war with each other under our system. They file lawsuits in the federal court system. And if that percolates all the way up to the final arbiter, the, to the Supreme Court, that court then adjudicates and says Kentucky's right and Virginia's wrong or the reverse or they're both right or both wrong. We need a final umpire. I certainly accept that. If you read the Constitution, the courts have – the Supreme Court at least has some powers of original jurisdiction uh, involving foreign countries and certain commercial things and so on. And so the founding fathers wrote in a certain level of original jurisdiction, in other words, cases that can start at the Supreme Court. So that's a constitutional power that the founding fathers discussed and they gave to the Supreme Court of the United States. They did not give the power of judicial veto to the courts. Now, just I wasn't there. I wasn't in Philadelphia, so I can't speak authoritatively about what they intended. But I think they wanted the courts to have a strong advisory role. So let's say that the uh, Federalist government under John Adams passes the sedition law, which it did in 1798. One would hope that the Supreme Court would look at that law which basically made it a crime to criticize the Adams administration. You would hope that the Supreme Court would look at that and say, in our opinion, that law, the sedition law, violates the First Amendment of the Constitution of the United States. We think that you cannot have a First Amendment and blithely pass a sedition law which effectively censors free speech. Therefore, we, the members of the Supreme Court, strongly urge the legislature to revisit those laws and to think better and to to try harder to make sure that they that they accord and resonate with the fundamental laws of this constitution that should be their role a strong even stern advisory role but not an actual veto over legislation duly passed by both houses of congress and signed by the chief executive the president of the united states that would be my preferred approach. Understood, Mr. Jefferson, but um, I am a bit confused on on who gets the final word. The people, the people, sir, get the final word because we are sovereign. And Rousseau was in some sense correct when he said the people are always right, even when they're wrong. Mr. President, we need to take a short break from this conversation. When we return, I'd like to delve into that question a bit farther and who speaks finally for the people. Thank you, sir. We'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to The Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with President Thomas Jefferson. Welcome back, Mr. Jefferson. Thank you, citizen. When we took our break, Mr. President, I was asking you, you know, who finally speaks for the people? Now it would seem that our Supreme Court has is, is, is become the final word on issues like uh, voting rights, immigration, personal freedoms. Isn't the Supreme Court supposed to make those decisions? No. And it's unseemly. And if you think about it rationally for a moment, let's take something that's uh, of great uh, national importance the status of the Second Amendment. Under what circumstances did the people have the right to keep and bear arms? As you know, there's an enormous, divisive, sometimes angry debate in the United States in your time about this. But you are for that right, aren't you? Yes, of course. And and my point is, though, that it wasn't a big issue in my time, but it is a gigantic one in your time. So how do we settle this? You need a national conversation. You need to have town meetings, as they do in New England. You need to gather people together. Legislative bodies in every state and territory need to debate this. There need to be newspaper wars and and debates. I understand that, Mr. President, but help me if I'm wrong, if I'm looking at this too simplistically, but 
We can have all the conversations we want, but if that law is challenged and goes before the Supreme Court, they decide. And how have we empowered nine unelected people to make a decision of that magnitude for more than 330 million Americans? Under what principle of the Constitution do those nine individuals have the right to make decisions that involve a third of a billion people? Do they know more? than you do about guns? Do they know more than you do about crime? Do they know more than you do about the Constitution and the original intent of the Founding Fathers? Yes, 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 Mr. President. I understand your your point, and it's well made. But that doesn't change the fact of where we are today. The Supreme Court gets the final This should never have happened, and you can change it. But it did happen. It if you did can't happen. come to terms with the Second Amendment, then the, re- the remedy is to have a an amendment or a new constitution and and fight it out. Gather together 55 or 550 people carefully chosen from amongst the population of the United States, put them into a room and say, we want you to wrestle with the use of guns in a free society and according to natural law and natural right, and we want you to come out with a solution that fits your time and your place. A Supreme Court justice may be prejudiced, he may be a gun lover, he may be a gun hater, he may believe that guns are are one of the bulwarks of human liberty, or he may think that they're a source of enormous public um, violence and corrosion. He may be somebody who loves this country, he may secretly not love this country. He may be well-educated in constitutional terms, he may be badly educated. He may have good mornings, and he may have bad mornings. He may have had a fight with his son. And he comes into the court and makes a decision that's going to affect the lives of a third of a billion people. We can't trust that much fundamental law and that much basic principle of our system to somebody who's that accidental and that unaccountable. And we, you know, you, you, you posit this. One posits this. Oh, we need these these people to sit in in isolation and make these determinations. But you're pretending that they're creatures out of Plato's Republic, but they're not. They're men like other men. They have the strengths and weaknesses of other men. They have the susceptibilities and the and the seductive abilities and the temptations of other men. We mustn't regard them as demigods. They are human beings, and they are no more able to make these decisions for you than they are for themselves. You may consider me a naive citizen when I make this statement, but I know that you were opposed to lifetime appointments. On the other hand, I choose to believe, as you do, in the goodness of people, that when they're put in that position, they're going to make the right choices. I believe in the goodness of man until he has power. And the minute he has power, I no longer believe in that. And I want to chain him by process and principle and constitutional fiat so that he can't do dangerous things. That's number one. I believe in the goodness of humanity. But the minute somebody has power, including myself, that person is no longer to be entirely trusted. That's the most important of the points that I wish to make. Secondly, we need to believe that every Supreme Court justice has a deep commitment to natural law, to human liberty, to the rights of man, to the Bill of Rights, But if you study the history of the court and look at all of the justices who have served since the time of George Washington until your own time, you will come up with what John Adams would call a mixed bag. Some outstanding jurists, some people of great brilliance but corrupt principles, like Mr. Hamilton would be, and then others who are mediocrities and non-entities. Humans bring different levels of focus, of principle, and of purity to the things that they do, and you cannot trust somebody over a 20 or 30 or 40-year period to maintain an absolutely strict commitment to civil rights and natural law. It just doesn't usually happen. And if you don't believe me, study the history of the Supreme Court of the United States. You will find, for example, one of my three appointees, uh, Thomas Todd of Kentucky, is almost universally regarded as one of the greatest mediocrities in the history of the Supreme Court. I take no delight in that. I name somebody, one of three, Todd, and he is by constitutional and judicial historians regarded as a profound mediocrity. That can't be good. I chose him thinking that he would be better, 
Life tenure makes it impossible to remove him. Well, let's use your good judgment, Mr. President. Who makes a good Supreme Court justice? What, what are we looking for? Is it proper judicial interpretation or something else? I think that you look for people who are brilliant jurists. They need to know how law works, the nuances of law, how precedent works, how legal discrimination is used to sort out a complex situation. Easy situations don't wind up at the Supreme Court, only very complex situations. You need somebody with a really serious, even breathtaking commitment to the rights of man and the principles of the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights. We should err on the side of human liberty. We should err on the side of human individualism. We should err on the side of human rights against government. Government has all of the advantages, the individual few. And so you want people with a very, very deep commitment to human rights and to the rights of man, especially as articulated under our system in the Bill of Rights. You want people of very wide reading and not just in the law, but in the history of culture, of philosophy, of literature, of different uh, approaches to life from the ancient people of the Near East to the Greeks and the Romans through the medieval world and the Norman conquest and Great Britain beginning with the Magna Carta and through the, the British um, revolution of, of 1688. You want people that are just deeply well-educated, but their prime star, the, the lodestar of their lives is the rights of man. And you want them to have a humble view of what a jurist represents in a society that wants to be a republic or a democracy. That's what I would look for. Mr. Jefferson, as you said, you you uh, made three appointments to the court. You mentioned Mr. Todd, the other two, William Johnson, Henry Livingston. Uh, did you have any sort of what we would call now a litmus test for these individuals? Yes, a couple of things. One is I want a geographic diversity. You don't want everyone to be from Massachusetts. You don't want everyone to be from Virginia. So I chose people from three different locations trying to keep a geographic balance on the court. And this is particularly true in my time because they rode circuit. In addition to being a Supreme Court justice, they had to actually ride into their district and, and adjudicate cases there. That's why John Marshall, for example, presided over the Aaron Burr treason trial in 1807 because it was his jurisdiction as a circuit-riding Supreme Court justice. So geographic diversity, that's, that's important. You want people who are moderates, who are not passionate zealots in any particular direction. And, of course, you want people who are qualified and would be regarded as qualified by any independent body of men who looked at their their credentials, their training, their temperament, their character, and their, and their qualifications. But when I say litmus test, Mr. President, I'm talking about issues, issues of the day. No, but I will say this, and I probably would not have admitted this during my lifetime, but I can now in, in retrospect. I was not about to appoint someone who was a Federalist. Well, these three gentlemen all pretty much agreed with your point I of view. I thought they did, but they, they turned out to be less uh, rigorous in promoting Republican values than I had hoped. I, I would not have appointed a high Federalist, never. That, that would be a mistake because they have a view of American jurisprudence and American government that's fundamentally at odds with my own, and mine is not just my own. It was the overwhelming... Uh, view of the American people in my time. So I, so I had a litmus test with, with respect to high federalism. You're saying then, Mr. President, that it's all right for a president to uh, make an appointment to the Supreme Court uh, based on uh, shared values in government. Yes. And so my basic point is, is, is a little complex. So listen carefully, everyone, if you can. I believe that the president has a right to surround himself by people of his own stamp in his cabinet, in his bureaucracy, and on the court system that elections matter. The people of the United States voted for me in 1800 and not to continue John Adams. They wanted a break with high federalism, and that gave me a mandate and empowered me to replace so far as I could public officials with people of my own stamp and people that represented the, the will of the people as I understood it and as I embodied it. So that's my first point. The president has a right to appoint people of his own stamp. Elections matter. If the Federalists had won in 1800, they would have had a right to, to put into the court system people of their own political persuasion. That's how a majoritarian system works. However, 
the more important point that I wish to make is that a Supreme Court justice should be essentially powerless. And the, the, the incredible concentration of power that that person has in your time brings about the kind of national crisis that you're now in because you've given them too much authority. You don't regard them as nine simple jurists now. You regard them as the oracle at Delphi, and whatever they determine becomes settled law for a third of a billion people. That should never have happened. It's easier to understand the system if the, if the courts are a weak third branch of government, when they become central in the way that they have become in your time, it changes everything. And it means that you're going to wrangle over the politics of these people when that's not the prime characteristic. You should be looking at their judicial temperament, their judicial training, their mastery of the history of case law, their understanding of our constitution. Those are the criteria. Those are the true litmus test. Is this person supremely qualified for this post more than almost any other American? Is this person supremely prepared and qualified to take on this sacred duty in our system? Not what's his opinion about guns or what's his opinion about immigration or what's his opinion about uh, race. Those things should never come up in a judicial conversation because they are politics, not law. I would suspect, Mr. President, that there are many Americans who would ask you, shouldn't what's best for the country supersede those other requirements? Who gets to decide? Well, the president. The president is one person who has been elected by all of the American people. That is true. He's not a king. He's not a monarch. He's not Napoleon. He is a first citizen, but he doesn't have the kind of powers that you would put in the life of Louis the Sixteenth or, or George the Third. We may be moving that direction. You have though. moved dangerously in that direction. The theory of our Constitution is legislative supremacy. So the legislature meets. The House wants to do something more radical. The Senate wants to do something more conservative. They have to come together in conference and, and hammer out their differences to produce something that they can both live with. And then it has to pass muster with the president. The president could veto it and say, I'm sorry, I don't think that this is good for the United States or I don't think that this is constitutional. So there has to be a fairly high level of consensus for anything to get done under our system. But that's where it belongs in the House, the Senate, and the executive in that order. That's where – the adjustment of our public lives belongs, not somewhere ac across the city in the camp of these nine unelected beings. Mr. Jefferson, you actually were disappointed with, with some of your appointees. In fact, you uh, corresponded with a Mr. Johnson about this. Uh, William Johnson, South Carolina, was the closest to my uh, view of this country of all three of the men that I appointed. And I had higher hopes for him. But he was so under the spell of the great John Marshall. I mean, Marshall served wine at casual receptions for his men, and he took them to taverns, and he, he tried to create a conviviality and a kind of a club, which is not in itself a bad thing, but Marshall was using it to co-opt the independent will of these other men, and they were powerless in some sense in the face of Marshall's intellect and Marshall's charisma. And so William Johnson of South Carolina proved to be less rigorous in um, pursuing my kind of states' rights, Republican, small government agenda than I had hoped. And so he, we had correspondence, and I tried to, to, to press him a little to stay pure and to resist the great John Marshall, but he, he had moments of great independence, don't get me wrong, but, but all three of the people that I appointed to the Supreme Court um, failed the test of being sufficiently rigorous to stand up to the, to the machinations and the twistifications of Marshall. There are presidents who followed you who called their uh, appointees uh, the biggest disappointment of their presidency, so you're not alone, sir. I did want to ask you about specific issues. During my time, there are what we would call hot-button issues that people go to right away when, the, when we think about choosing a new Supreme Court justice. In other words, how do you vote on this issue? Was there anything like that during your time, sir? We did not have most of the issues that you have in your time. 
But our biggest concern was, and it goes back to what Franklin said at the end of the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia. As you know, when he walked out, a woman said, what have you given us? And he said, a republic, if you can keep it. And really, that was the issue of the United States from 1787 until at least 1865, a republic. But can you keep it? And so I wanted us to have small government, local control, decentralization, to limit especially the consolidated federal government, to make sure there was a strong wall of separation between the military and the civilian authority, to maintain budget, conservatism, and fiscal responsibility. I wanted the smallest government that we could possibly have to hold us together as a people and to defer to state and local governments wherever possible. And so we had to fight for that. That was the issue of our time, which is how much government is appropriate in a free society. That that horse has left the stable in your time. You have a leviathan of centralized government, and, and you fight a little around the edges, but you have so much government that I think even Alexander Hamilton might be appalled if he saw it in your time. That's quite a strong statement, Mr. Jefferson. I think it's true. I think that, that Hamilton, for all of his faults, was a lover of human liberty, and he wanted government to have a restrained approach to the American people. And I do not think that that is the, the way you go about things in the early 21st century. Uh, I'm leaving this conversation, Mr. Jefferson, with the feeling that you believe that this is probably the greatest threat to our republic. When you tear up your constitution next time and settle the issues of the Second Amendment and reproductive rights and abortion and immigration and due process and all the First Amendment, as you re-examine them and clarify them, I would urge you, when tearing up the constitution, to make severe limitations on the power of the courts to limit the tenure of your justices, to make them stand for a vote of confidence or no confidence from time to time, and to reassert the principle in our republic of legislative supremacy. Mr. Jefferson, I must thank you for this spirited conversation. It's left me a bit weary and worried, but uh, we shall we shall proceed on. Sir, read books and take long walks in nature. We're going to take a short break, but we'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to The Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with President Thomas Jefferson. And now it is time for our weekly conversation with the creator of The Thomas Jefferson Hour, the gentleman seated across from me now, Mr. Clay Jenkinson. Good to see you, sir. Good to see you, my friend. Here we are in the New Enlightenment Radio Network barn somewhere in rural North Dakota. You know, I have to say that the, uh, this week's show, President Jefferson surprised me. His personal feelings, uh, well, he, they were on his sleeve. Jefferson had some sort of a deep uh, animosity towards the Supreme Court. Uh, part of that came because of John Marshall. John Marshall was a genius. Um, I think he might have been one of the very best Supreme Court justices in American history. But Marshall's command, his um, wiliness as a judicial thinker, uh, was such that he was able to outmaneuver Jefferson on a number of questions. And Marshall read the Constitution in the most centralized, most nationalistic way. And Jefferson wanted to read it in a much in a way much closer to the old Articles of Confederation. And so Jefferson thought, why is this one man, admittedly gifted, able to to transform the way we think about our Constitution and interpret it? That's not something that one person should have the power to do. So Jefferson has a principled concern about this, and I think he was right. The problem with it, David, is, all right, so if you if you if you follow Jefferson and say there's no final umpire, then what? You have to have some way of settling fundamental differences in a free society. Take the obvious example of when the contested election of Gore versus Bush went to the Supreme Court in the year 2000. Right or wrong in their decision, we can debate that for the end of time, they eventually made a decision and said, look, to the best of our capacity, we've decided that Bush won. We're going to give our imprimatur the, 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 the accumulated credibility of the, of the Supreme Court over time, we're going to give that weight to saying that Bush won 
and Gore lost. Now, many people think that was the wrong decision, but there had to be a final umpire because otherwise, what do you have? Civil war? Do you, what, what, how do you solve fundamental problems that are at the heart of a free society if there isn't some sort of umpire? If you just had baseball games or basketball games where the players called their own fouls, it would soon de- devolve into fist fights and maybe worse. So you defer to the ref, and you may think the ref made a terrible decision. You may denounce them. You may, you may think, how can we go on with the principle of this corruptibility? But it's better than the alternative of having chaos. And so Jefferson was never able to articulate a completely rational alternative, and his idea that the justices will be kind of this stern set of civil libertarians who will give stern advice— what if the Congress says, well, we don't want your stern advice. We don't care what you think. We're just going to do what we want. So everyone gets why there is a final arbiter. But for Jefferson, the problem with that, David, is that it's not in any real sense democratic. I go back to, to what I started with is that I was surprised at how personally agitated Mr. Jefferson was this week. And I'm certain that you would defend your interpretation of his feelings you just did. I do believe that I have it right, but if people want to read more about this, there are good books on this subject, and the one that I would recommend is by James Simon, S-I-M-O-N, What Kind of Nation? Thomas Jefferson, John Marshall, and the Epic Struggle to Create a United States. There are other books, um, one called The Constitutional Thought of Thomas Jefferson by a man named Mayer, but the book that I would recommend most is James Simon, What Kind of Nation? Thomas Jefferson, John Marshall, and the Epic Struggle to create the United States. And, you know, Jefferson is a believer in the will of the people. So let's just take another simple case. Let's say there are 10 of us and we decide to um, shut down our presses for a month because we're afraid that unscrupulous people will publish something that gets us into a war with Canada. So we as the legislature pass a law that says we're throwing out the First Amendment for the next month because it's such a critical moment. We don't trust the people to be responsible. The court then says, wait a minute. You can't do that. There's a First Amendment. You can't just do that. The will of the people is sometimes wrong. The will of the people sometimes fails to separate church and state. The will of the people sometimes wants cruel and unusual punishments. The will of the people sometimes has a illegal searches and seizures. The will of the people sometimes uh, forgets to permit habeas corpus so that if someone is, is actually able to see the charges that are leveled against him and have an appearance with counsel in front of a court of law. So the courts say, wait a minute, you can pass a law, but sometimes that law is at odds with the set of ground rules, the monopoly rules, the social compact that we have all agreed upon. And when that happens, we, the court, have to say no. That may seem like the right thing to do. It may even be wildly popular, but it doesn't square with the bigger, more fundamental set of rules that you laid out at the beginning. And whenever that happens, we have to be the umpire to check you and say no. However interesting or useful or popular that law might be, it does not square with the deeper set of principles and values of this culture. And therefore, we have to stand up against the will of the people to say, you failed in this instance. That's the theory. But as you know, the courts have been all over the map. The courts permitted the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II. The courts in uh, the slaughterhouse cases towards the end of the 19th century uh, argued that the 14th Amendment protected corporations, but they didn't bother to argue that it protected African Americans. If you look at the history of the decisions of the court, they're very often wrong. Plessy versus Ferguson. And the court argued at the end of the 19th century that we should have a nation of separate but equal facilities for black people and white people. Dred Scott, the court argued on the eve of the Civil War that a black person had no rights that our Constitution was bound to respect. The court has been shot through with bad decisions that would make you cringe or blush if you have anything like a sense of fair play in America. But I think you need to take historical context into that statement when you make it. I want to ask you, though, about Marbury versus Madison. Yes, sir. And and what contemporary Americans who don't really know a lot about that 
that decision. Uh, but could you explain to him why it's so critical and important? If you go to law school, in the first few weeks, you're going to face Marbury v. Madison. And so here's what happened. It involves the midnight appointments. So Adams has been diselected, but he's still president. And so he tries to pack the courts and name a lot of friends and other people that he trusts to, into positions in the judicial branch of government, in part because they have to be filled and in part he wants to forestall the more radical elements of Jefferson's agenda. These are known as the midnight appointments. Jefferson resented them. Almost all of the midnight appointments went through, including John Marshall. Jefferson, when he came into power, said to Madison, who was his secretary of state, if they got the commissions, if they were given the job, we have to respect it, even though we hate it. And they did. But a handful of the commissions had not actually been physically delivered to the intendant recipients. They were there. They had been passed. They had been approved, signed by Adams. But since they were still on the desk in the State Department, Jefferson said to Madison, if they weren't delivered, just throw them away. Because if it's delivered, we'll, we'll honor that. But if they weren't physically delivered, then in some sense, the contract wasn't closed. So we'll void those. And they voided a handful of them. And one of them was a man named William Marbury, who had been appointed to be a justice of the peace in Washington, D.C. So he sues. He suits under something called a writ of mandamus. A writ of mandamus says, hey, hand it over. Adams approved it. He signed it. There's a, there's a, there's a commission for me to be a justice of the peace. Hand it over. That's a writ of mandamus. So he sued James Madison, the secretary of state, because he wanted his commission. And it went to the Supreme Court. And in this key decision in the spring of 1803, John Marshall, writing for the majority, said, we wish we could give him his, um, his commission, but we can't. Why? Because the provision in the 1789 judicial law that would govern this was unconstitutional because it actually is in violation of a constitutional principle. So it was really clever. So what John Marshall says is, Jefferson should have given the commission to Marbury. How dare you not give it to him? But I can't give Marbury relief because what he's suing under the mandamus clause of the Judiciary Act of 1789 is unconstitutional because it doesn't resonate with the provisions of the Constitution. So even though Marbury is right, even though Jefferson is wrong and he should have given him the commission, I can't grant that relief because that provision of that law is unconstitutional. So two things here, three things. First of all, Poor Marbury gets nothing. Secondly, Marshall browbeats Jefferson and shames him publicly. And third, this is the part that nobody understood at the time, Marshall installs into his decision the principle of judicial review. He says whenever a provision in a law is at odds with the fundamental principles of the Constitution, it is the business of this court to strike them down. So this doesn't get done again until Dred Scott, you know, decades later. But Marshall has slyly inserted this kind of worm, this kind of virus. That, that we live with to this day. We're out of time for the discussion this week, and, and we didn't even get to the Tenth Amendment. We may have to revisit this. Those powers not delegated to the national government belong instead to the states and to the people. It's a big deal, too. Anyway. And Roe you know, Ro was, Ro was kind of strangely founded in the Ninth Amendment. Almost every constitutional historian that I've ever met with says that it wasn't good constitutional argumentation. And so that's another issue is that to find an abortion right in the Constitution is a, is a twistification. And that's what Jefferson was against. As I say, we shall have to revisit this, sir. But right now, it is time for this week's Jefferson Watch. We like to think of the Supreme Court as a nonpartisan and completely independent branch of government that make sure laws passed by Congress and the states conform to the provisions of the United States Constitution. The Supreme Court aspires to that Olympian detachment and judicial neutrality, but seldom achieves it. Like it or not, there is a political substratum in court appointments, and it can produce great political tension at unsettled moments in American life, like now. Presidents nominate Supreme Court justices, and the Senate has to confirm. There has been occasional trouble since the very beginning. The first justice to be denied a seat on the court was a man named John Rutledge. It was 1795, just seven years into the new constitutional experiment. Rutledge had written an op-ed piece critical of the Jay Treaty, a 1794 treaty with Britain that tried to resolve certain lingering issues from the War of Independence. 
That was enough for a Federalist Senate to scotch his candidacy. Jefferson came into office in 1801 in what he called the Second American Revolution, but poised to prevent that revolution was Chief Justice John Marshall, Jefferson's distant cousin. He was put into his life-tenured position in the last months of John Adams' failed one-term administration. Adams, who distrusted Jefferson's democratic radicalism, essentially engaged in last-minute court packing, Marshall and dozens of other midnight appointments, to make sure that Jefferson did not take things too far to the left. Marshall went on to serve for 34 years. He was perhaps the greatest of all Supreme Court justices. He was indeed a thorn in Jefferson's side. Marshall wanted America to be a great centralized nation state, not a confederation of sovereign states. He wanted a nation that prized the sanctity of contract above any temporary notion of social justice. He despised Jefferson's vision of a lightly governed, inward-looking, agriculturally based loose association of proud commonwealths like Virginia and Pennsylvania. We now live in Marshall's America, not Jefferson's. Jefferson struck back at the judiciary in 1804 by convincing his partisans in the House of Representatives to impeach Supreme Court Justice Samuel Chase, a signer of the Declaration of Independence who had become an obnoxious and outspoken anti-Democrat from the bench. The question was, can you impeach a justice for what you regard as his nasty politics? The U.S. Senate chose not to convict Chase. Jefferson seemed to have sensed that he was playing a dangerous game here one that could erode constitutional stability. In the aftermath, he admitted that such impeachments were what he called a bungling enterprise, and he desisted from meddling with the independence of the judiciary thereafter. Jefferson appointed three justices to the Supreme Court. Every one of them wound up disappointing him. The last attempt to pack the court was 1937, when Franklin Roosevelt, just re-elected in a landslide, attempted to increase the number of justices from 9 to 15, so that his emergency New Deal legislation would not be struck down by judicial conservatives any longer. Congress balked. Even Democrats in Congress, including senators and representatives who were devoted to the New Deal, refused to give Roosevelt such unprecedented power. He was frustrated, but this is how our system is supposed to work. What we should want is a justice with a first-rate mind, great analytical powers, an unusually high capacity for legal discernment and nuance, a deep grounding in the history of law, the history of natural rights, and the history of constitutions, particularly our constitution. What we want is someone who knows a great deal about original intent but is not a slave to original intent. That was then, and this is now, and by the way, the constitution was written to protect slavery, So how original do we really wish it to be? We want someone who prizes a strict protection of human rights over government efficiency and over economic prosperity. What you want on a court is a few crabby civil libertarians who understand that the whole genius of America is to leave as many people alone as possible, as often and emphatically as possible. So why are we locked into an angry national cage match on Roe v. Wade, the abortion decision issued by the Supreme Court in 1973? Both parties are behaving in a deplorable manner. The Republicans want the nominee to pledge to overturn Roe v. Wade. The Democrats insist that he or she must hint at least that she will leave current abortion law in place. Not only is this the wrong basis on which to give someone life tenure, but it trivializes the third branch of our national government into a policy club consisting of nine unelected and largely unaccountable beings. The great questions of a great nation should not be decided by nine unelected people. They are men and women like other men and women, capable of nobility and capable of pettiness, vengefulness, ignorance, prejudice, bigotry, pride, and self-aggrandizement. They have good days and bad days. They see some issues with great clarity, and others with the kind of muddled gut reactions that characterize all of the rest of us. The future of this country should be in the hands of an infinitely wider body than the Supreme Court. It would be like letting the starting lineup of the Chicago Cubs determine the future of the United States. I believe the nomination process should be taken out of the hands of American presidents who misunderstand and misuse their appointment power for narrow and often temporary purposes. 
and put instead into the hands of a severely nonpartisan think tank of constitutional experts who look for raw judicial talent irrespective of that person's political views. America is awash in men and women who would be outstanding Supreme Court justices. But the very last questions we should want to ask them is where they stand on Roe v. Wade or the Affordable Care Act or affirmative action. I'm Clay Jenkinson. We'll see you next week for another exciting edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education. The program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public Radio. President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826, and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author, Clay S. Jenkinson. To obtain a copy of this or any past show for a $12 donation, please call 888-828-2853. Again, that number is 888 888- 828-2853. This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.org and on iTunes. If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.org. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is produced at Makoche Recording Studios in Bismarck, North Dakota. Music by Stephen Swinford. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking, historically accurate program through the eyes of Thomas Jefferson.